Hello and welcome to another free online homework help video from alexpleasehelp.com. My name is Alex and I'm here to help. I received a problem from Deb in Ohio who has an issue with a problem about acceleration on an inclined plane. This particular problem involves two-dimensional vectors, Newton's second law of motion, and inclined planes. So let's get to the problem. Before I get too deep into the problem, I recommend hitting the HQ button, which is down here, or expand the player video size, which is a little double arrow icon up at the top. It makes reading the text a lot easier based on the way I'm recording these videos. So here's the problem. A 2,500 kilogram car is resting on a parking lot ramp, which is inclined at 10 degrees. The car is then put into neutral and then starts moving down the ramp. One. Calculate the acceleration of the, of the car on the ramp. Two, how long would the ramp have to be for the car to break 30 miles an hour speed limit? Three, how much time would it take for the car to reach the end of the ramp in part two? Okay, so first thing you always do, collect the data that you know in the problem. So we have the mass of the car, which is 2,500 kilograms. And we can go ahead and calculate the weight from that, which is just mass times gravity which is 24,516 newtons and some change. Theta of the ramp equals 10 degrees. And we know from in part two, we're going to need some velocity, which is its max velocity, which is 30 miles an hour. Doing unit conversions, which I'm not going to get into, 13.41 meters per second. The second step, always draw a diagram so that you know what the heck's going on in the problem. And here's my lovely hand-drawn diagram. I do all my own, so don't laugh. Okay, we have a car rolling down a ramp. And we have forces acting on the car. It's in neutral, so the engine is not exerting a force on it in either way. And you can neglect air resistance. I didn't say that in the problem, but for this case, you can go ahead and neglect it. So one of the forces that we have is the normal force. If we didn't have the normal force, it would just fall right through the ramp. The normal force is always perpendicular to the ramp. That's this guy right here. The second force that all matter has in the presence of a gravitational field is weight. And that goes directly down. The third step, and it's related to the diagram, you always have to specify what direction your axes are pointing. They can be exactly horizontal and vertical, or you can have them aligned with the surface that the object is moving on. If you do it that way, it makes your uh, equations a lot easier. Because if you have your y direction perpendicular and your x direction horizontal, your acceleration is going to have x and y components because it's on an incline. The acceleration is directly aligned on this incline because it can't go through the ramp. So it's going to go right down the ramp. So if you align the x-axis with the ramp and the y-axis perpendicular to it, it makes things a little easier, and, I'll, and you'll see why coming up here. Okay, once you have your diagram and your coordinate system set up, then you, try to, you say, okay, what am I trying to figure out? Part one is asking, what is the acceleration of the car along the ramp? So bringing out your Newton's second law equations, sum of forces equals mass times acceleration. You know that forces and accelerations are both vectors, so you need to work with their components separately. The sum of the forces in the y direction is going to equal mass times acceleration in y direction. The sum of forces in the x direction is going to equal the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. It's kind of wordy, but it's just f equals ma, but with its components. So working with the y direction first, we can infer from the way we have our coordinate system set up that the acceleration in the y direction is going to be zero because it can't move through the ramp. And it's not rising off of the ramp, it's just going along the ramp. So its acceleration in the y direction is going to be zero. So if we plug zero into ay, we get the sum of all forces in the y direction is going to be zero. the vertical force Fn here, the normal force, minus the y component of the weight. This angle right here on this triangle is 10 degrees, just like it's the same angle here, but the inside angle is 10. So the y component, if you 
cock your head to the side a little bit, you, it might make it easier to see which equation you're supposed to use, which trig, which trig function. The y component of the weight is w times cosine of theta. So the normal force minus w cosine theta equals zero. Rewriting, we see that the normal force equals weight times cosine theta. Now we might need this, we might not, but we'll go a little further and we'll see what, what happens. Next, moving along to the x direction. The x forces, there's only one of them. The normal force is not working in the x direction based on the way we have our coordinate system drawn. The only x force is the x component of the weight, which is weight times sine theta. So if that's the only force, then the sum of the forces equaling ma, we have weight times sine theta equals mass times acceleration in the x direction. So we know weight from earlier, we know theta, it's given in the problem, and we know mass, it's given in the problem. The only unknown in this equation is ax. So when we rewrite it to solve for ax, we see ax equals weight times sine of 10 degrees divided by mass. And when you plug and chug your known values, you get 1.7 meters per second squared. And that's part one, that's the acceleration of the car. If that's all you cared about, you can stop the video here, but we're going to move on to part two. Part two asks about the length of the ramp. How long does the ramp have to be for the car to break the 30 mile an hour speed limit? So as it's going down, it's accelerating. Its velocity is picking up, 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 up. So we know that the acceleration from part one equals 1.703 meters per second squared. The problem states that the car starts from rest, so we can immediately say that the initial velocity, v0, equals zero. Its final velocity is what we're looking, is what's given in the problem as the 30 miles an hour. So over here, when we do, whoops, when we do the unit conversion, we get 30 miles an hour equals 13.41 meters per second, and that's it up here. So we're looking for delta x along the ramp. Using or remembering your the kinematic equations, the equations of motion, there are a couple choices you have, but the easiest one is the time independent equation. I'll put a link in, in the video description of how you can derive these equations, uh, but I'm not going to get into that now. I'm just going to tell you that the easiest equation to use for this problem is this one, the vf squared equals v naught squared plus 2ax delta x because we know v final, we know v initial, we know acceleration, we're looking for delta x. There's only one unknown in this equation. And rewriting the equation so that we can solve for it, we get delta x equals vf squared minus v, minus v naught squared divided by 2ax. Plugging and chugging known values, we get that delta x equals 52.81 meters. So that's part two. That's how long the ramp would have to be. So when the car reaches 30 miles an hour, it's gone 52.8 meters. Okay, moving on to part three. Part three, well, how long, or how much time has elapsed when it reaches 30 miles an hour? So how long did it take to get to the end of that ramp? How long did it take to reach, to go 52 meters? Ah, keep messing these things up. Okay, so. From before, we have our known information. We have our acceleration, we have our initial velocity, we have our final velocity, and we have our distance traveled. There are two equations that you can use to solve for time. The, the two of them in particular are this one and this one. Delta x equals v naught t plus one half at squared, or v final equals v initial plus ax t. If we work with the top one, I'll work both of them so you can see, so you can figure out for yourself which one's easier. You can simplify this top one because v naught equals zero. So we get delta x equals one half a t squared. The only unknown on the problem is t. So when we rewrite and solve for t, we get t equals the square root of two delta x over ax, which equals 7.875 seconds. If you use the second equation, vf equals v naught a x t, the only unknown in this equation is time. So when you rewrite and solve for time, 
you get t equals v final minus v initial divided by ax, and that also equals 7.875 seconds. So you can use either equation. Sometimes if you have an initial velocity, I'd recommend using the second one, because if you have an initial velocity, you'll have to do the Pythagorean, not the Pythagorean theorem, the quadratic formula, and because you have two time portions here, you end up with a quadratic. So, so the second one might is typically easier. So that's how you solve this problem. If you anybody out there has another tricky problem that you're struggling with, send it on over to me. I have a form that you can submit it in at www.alexpleasehelp.com.